Well, hello, Woodman. Happy New Year. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are so thankful that you have chosen to be with us to start your 2021. We got a great service in store. Uh, since some of us are going to be going back to some in person gatherings next weekend, we thought we would take some of our highlights and personal favorites over these last 10 months in the way that God has met with us during worship and looking and singing along to those. After that, Pastor Kirby is going to get us looking ahead to this new year with God's word. And as I said, next week, some of us will be gathering in person together. Registration for those services are open, and please ensure that you are on our church email address to get campus-specific instructions for where you'll be headed and what you can expect, certainly across all of our campuses. We will be socially distanced, we will be wearing masks, and we will be lifting high the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, whether in one of our auditoriums, whether in your huddle, perhaps your community group, or you following along from wherever it is you are. Finally, as you think about 2021, think about community groups. Think about getting into a Woodman U class. Participate with what God is doing here. And now, get ready to sing. shadows deepen but do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through do you wish that you could see it all made new it's all The glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst. It is. is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole?
Happy New Year, Woodman. My name is Kirby, and I oversee the student ministry here at Woodman, and I love doing it. 
You know, occasionally Pastor Josh gives me the opportunity to speak to adults. That's not exactly what I'm used to, but man, I'm so thankful to be with you here today. And when Josh spoke to me about sharing with you this weekend, he gave me kind of the the freedom to pick the passage and pick the topic. And so as I began to think and pray, it just... It just kind of made sense to me to share with you about something that is very near and dear to my heart. It is about what I believe is one of the greatest resources in the church of Jesus. Probably the greatest resource would be like the Holy Spirit. So this isn't quite like the greatest, um, but it's really close. It ranks up there. A resource that I believe is underutilized currently in our world. And that underutilization is not only causing us to lose potential ground in the kingdom of heaven, but is also causing damage to that resource. That resource is young people. Now, I know that like I'm the youth pastor and not everyone shares the same enthusiasm that I have for young people. It's my job. I get it. I know that young people can be a challenge to understand and sympathize with at times. I know they can be like frustrating and distracted. I know they can smell bad at times. I know they can even be arrogant or hard-headed or think they know more than their adult friends do. I know they can be self-centered. I know they can be inconsiderate at times. But I also know the significant place that they hold in the kingdom of God. I also know that, that there is tremendous potential for them to play that significant role that they can and should play in the church. When I'm in a room of young people, I just can't help but think of the amount of potential that I am surrounded with. Potential to change this world. And this world has a lot of things in it that need to change. Please open your Bibles this morning to Jeremiah chapter 1. We're going to be there today. We're going to be looking at two young people who were each incredible resources to God's people. Let me pray. Father, I thank you that we can be here together today. Even though we're not exactly here, we're scattered all over Uh, this city. God, I I pray that you would speak very clearly to us. No matter what our age is uh, today as we're listening, uh, God, I pray your word uh, would speak truth to us, that it would challenge us, challenge the way we do things, and that it will shape our perspective. God, I I pray for all the young people who are listening right now. Uh, God, would you inspire them? God, would you utilize them to do big things in our world? as a result of what your word has to say to us today. And God, please help me um, as I try to convey that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1. It says this, The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests at Amphoth, in the territory of Benjamin. The word of the Lord came to him in the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. And through the reign of Joachim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, and down to the fifth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. The book of Jeremiah starts off by introducing us to its central character, this prophet Jeremiah. And it's right at the beginning of his ministry, like God is just beginning to, to call him to ministry. And by setting us up for the scene in which Jeremiah's ministry kicks off, we can kind of begin to understand what's happening in Jeremiah's world right now. The setting, the time frame, the climate. The setting, Jeremiah's ministry took place when the nation of Israel was split into two different kingdoms. You had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And the southern kingdom is where Jeremiah's ministry was focused. And at this time, whenever Jeremiah enters the scene, Uh, the the northern kingdom is actually in exile. It has been conquered, uh, taken off, carried away. um, And and the southern kingdom is the only one that remains. The time frame, verse 2, casually tells us that Jeremiah's ministry began in the 13th year of the reign of King Josiah. And that's actually a pretty significant, that's a big detail that we're going to cover in just a few minutes. But then it spans the reign of three more kings, three more sons of Josiah. And it ends when the prophet 
when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. So when that southern kingdom finally did go into exile. At 21,673 words, the book of Jeremiah is the longest book we have in the Bible. Jeremiah's ministry spread more than four decades, 40 plus years of events that it covered. The climate, when Jeremiah's ministry begins, like I said before, the northern kingdom had already been conquered and carried off into exile. And the southern kingdom was still there. 2 Kings 17 explains it like this, actually starting in 16. They forsook all the commands of their Lord and made for themselves two idols cast in the shape of calves in an Asherah pole. They bowed down to all the starry hosts and they worshipped Baal. They sacrificed their sons and daughters in the fire. They practiced divination and sought omens and sold themselves to do evil things in the sight of the Lord, arousing his anger. So the Lord was very angry at Israel and removed them from his presence. Only the tribe of Judah was left. And then going down to verse 23. Until the Lord removed them from his presence as he, is, had, as he had worn through all his servants, through all the prophets, so that the people of Israel were taken from their homeland into exile in Syria, and they are still there. So when Jeremiah enters the scene, all of this had already happened. Samaria and Israel and the northern kingdom had been ransacked and conquered. And anyone of importance was carried off and taken into Assyria. You might imagine how the people felt, maybe the morale around the country in the tribe of Judah, like their remaining and their kinsmen have been conquered. Um, You just might imagine how they felt. Uh, W.G. Moorhead kind of describes it like this. He says, It was Jeremiah's lot to prophesy at a time when all things in Judah were rushing down to the final mournful catastrophe. When political excitement was at its height, when the worst passions were swaying the various parties and the most fatal counsel prevailed. As I read that, that just kind of statement about the, the world that Jeremiah was living in, I kind of got to think like, Man, this might, this might be something that an old timer might say even about the climate of our country right now. The climate of, of what we're experiencing right now in the United States. Political excitement at its height. Passion swaying parties. Fatal counsel prevailing. The warning of a final mournful catastrophe. That sounds a lot like 2020. This could be a modern day conversation that I had with my dad about the climate of America like even yesterday. But there is an important feature of the political climate that we must not leave out. Leave out. Jeremiah mentions that, that the king of Judah was this guy named Josiah. And so for a few minutes, let's talk about the king of Judah and what made him so special. This king, his heart, his actions are actually the key reason that Judah is spared up until this point, that Judah is not in Assyria with their kinsmen. We know a little bit about about, uh, Josiah, so we're going to cover that, okay? In his 13th year is whenever Jeremiah's ministry began. But Josiah, let's kind of drill down to that. There's there's a few passages from out of Chronicles and out of Kings that will help us understand who this guy Josiah was. His reign followed two evil kings, a guy named Manasseh and Ammon. Manasseh was taken prisoner by Assyria, and Ammon was assassinated. Josiah became king of Judah at the ripe young age of eight years old. Eight years old, right? All the young people who are listening right now are like, it's good to be king, <laughs> right? This eight-year-old was unique. Second Kings 22.2 says this, He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the way of his father David, not turning to the left or to the right. Yeah, that was said of someone who started their role as king as an eight-year-old. In the eighth year of of his kingship, as a 16-year-old, I know we have some high schoolers listening right now. According to 2 Chronicles 34.3, he began to earnestly seek God. We have at our church some incredible 15 and 16 and 17, some high school students in our church who, just like Josiah, earnestly seek the Lord. Continuing through 2 Chronicles uh, 34, it says in in verse 3 that in his 12th year, this was right before Jeremiah came on the scene, that Josiah, um, as a 20-year-old, began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of all their false gods. 
He began tearing down Asherah poles. He began uh, destroying the carved idols and the cast images, correcting their sin and bringing repentance. But probably most notably came in his 18th year of reign, 26-year-old Josiah. He, he decided to have God's temple repaired and, and restored and found a book of the law, one of the workers there, likely Deuteronomy, which had kind of been forgotten and pushed aside. Um, and Josiah began to have one of the, have it read. And as he was listening to it, um, it just brought like a, a repentance and a zealousness to bring reform to Judah in, in Josiah's heart. And even to like the city of Jerusalem, even to the rest of the northern kingdom and those who were left behind. So because of his heart and actions, the southern kingdom, Judah, is spared for a time uh, from the fate of the rest of God's people. God says uh, to Josiah in 2 Kings twenty two nineteen, 19, because your heart was responsive, because you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I had spoken against this place and its people, that they would that they would become a curse and be laid waste. And because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, I will gather you to your ancestors and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see the disaster I am going to bring on this place. It was because of this young person's responsive heart and humble actions that an entire nation is spared from God's judgment. Listen to the description uh, of Josiah. Listen to how he goes down in history in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 24. Just to, that next little section there. It says, Furthermore, Josiah got rid of all the mediums and spiritists, all the household gods, all the idols, and all other detestable things in Judah and in Jerusalem. He did so to fulfill the requirements of the law written in the book that Hilkiah the priest had discovered in the temple of the Lord. Neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his strength in accordance with the law of Moses. There was no king before or after this young man. You know, the timing, the setting, the climate of Josiah and Jeremiah's world was hard and discouraging, but there was hope and a young leader particularly named Josiah. I probably don't have to tell you, we talked about it for a few minutes, but our our time frame, our setting, our climate right now can be pretty discouraging. 2020 was a tough year for a lot of us. All you have to do is like turn on CNN or Fox News or your choice of social media and pay attention for a few minutes. And if you aren't discouraged, you'll probably be discouraged shortly thereafter. I mean, a lot of us are saying, like, thank goodness 2020 is over because it's been a rough one. There's been a lot of discouragement, a lot of hopelessness, a lot who are struggling with marriages, a lot who are struggling financially, mental health and isolation. It's been a struggle for sure. We've had at least three students in our church die as a result of suicide uh, since this pandemic thing started. And many more are struggling with the isolation and the mental health implications. And the political climate, right? History has never held such a divided nation on such a broad range of issues. The election was among the closest elections in history, which tells us that like half the country is on one side and half the country is on the other side with a lot of key issues. I don't have to tell you the climate is tough. But can I tell you that I have hope? I have hope in the leadership of great leaders. Some of whom, like, haven't even entered adolescence yet. Young Josiahs who can lead us. Some listening to the sound of my voice right now, who I believe God is already using and wants to continue to use more to lead the church, to lead God's people to a great awakening. Young people who will lead us with hearts, with actions like Josiah did for God. Young people who will fiercely choose to end habits and paradigms and sins of their predecessors. Young people who with zeal and passion for Jesus will follow his law. That maybe even some of us older people 
have kind of discouraged, kind of pushed aside, grown calloused, much like the people of Josiah's day. I believe that young people can lead us to revival, to avoid the impending doom that our and our people's disobedience and godlessness can bring. The leadership of this next generation, it's promising. You know, I have a I have a good friend who cuts my hair. His name's Jeff. He's been cutting my hair for like seven years now. Um, his kids go to Woodman. He's, he's a great guy. If, if you need a haircut, I know a guy. I can hook you up. Um, but Jeff is like, he, he's a big guy. He's like six foot eight. So he towers over me. When I hug him, it's like, which is different for me, right? <laughs> um, but he's a big guy. And he's originally from Chicago, and he loves basketball, and of course, he loves the Chicago Bulls. Often when I get my hair cut, he like has a basketball game going on in the background. And a couple months ago, I, I was in uh, getting a haircut, and he had the LA Lakers playing, right? And, and the game was going on, and um, LeBron James uh, was playing. And I'm not really, I don't know a lot about sports. I, I don't know why. I'm just not super into it. So Jeff knows this. He begins to tell me about how good LeBron James is, about how big of a deal, big of a basketball player this guy is, right? And so he begins to tell me all about him. And I'm like, cool. And so I think of a good question, right? Jeff's a basketball guy. He's from Chicago. He loves the Bulls. I know who Michael Jordan is. And so I'm like, hey, Jeff, Who's a better basketball player, LeBron James or Michael Jordan? And naturally, I expected this guy from Chicago who loves the Bulls for him to say Michael Jordan all the way. But here's what he said. Jeff said, it depends. Jordan was better at winning. Jordan was like the best at winning. Like I think he said six national titles, never Um, defeated in the play. He gave me a bunch of stats. He told me how great Michael Jordan was. But then he goes, LeBron. He's a better team player. He raises the level at which the team around him plays. He sees other team members' strengths and he capitalizes on them. He passes the ball to them at just the right time. He encourages them to be better. LeBron's team is a better team. Even the earnings and the salaries of the guys who play with him grows just because they've got the experience of playing on LeBron's team. They play better and become more valuable as a team when they are with LeBron. Here's the thing, church. I think you're doing an incredible job as the church of Jesus. Woodman, you are loving well. You are sharing Christ with our world. I'm so proud to be a part of this church. Keep up the good work. But in this team of God's kingdom, we are surrounded by tremendously talented young people. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of us are playing like Jordan, playing like Michael Jordan. And actually, that's not a good thing right? We're playing to win, and in a lot of ways, we are winning. However, we are not utilizing the team well. We are not helping the team succeed. Young people are ready to jump into the game right now. Paul said to Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, young Timothy, but set an example in the way you live and your life and your faith and your purity. Paul told him, It doesn't matter that you're young. You are ready to do God's work now. No king was ever like Josiah, whose reign started when the guy was eight years old, whose godly heart and actions affected an entire nation. Our young people, like Josiah, they are capable. Let's not lead like Jordan when we should be leading like LeBron. Let's not get so good at winning that we forget about the team that we have around us. My wife says it a lot. But young, my wife says that I say it a lot. That's exactly what she says. Whenever I was practicing today, she was like, you say that a lot. And I was like, well, I'm going to say it because I believe it. Young people are not the church of the future. They're not. They're the church of right now. King Josiah was not the king of the future at eight years old. 
He was the king. He did incredible stuff to turn God's people back to God. He was kicking tail and taking names as an 8-year-old, as a 12-year-old, as a 16-year-old, as a 20-year-old, and as a 26-year-old. Please, adults listening right now, please let young people lead. Please pass them the ball. Please help them succeed as leaders. Don't call them the church of the future. Don't treat them like someday they will contribute to the king of, kingdom of God. Because just like Josiah was, the young people of Woodman, of the church, are capable right now. Let's play our part in helping them realize their leadership potential. So as we start, started this study with, with this prophet named Jeremiah, we kind of got sidetracked with Josiah, who was the king during that day. We're going to go back to, to Jeremiah in verse 4. Verse 4 says this, The word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. I think, when I think of Jeremiah the prophet, I think of like an old guy with like gray hair and a long beard. Uh, but Jeremiah is actually a young person here, just starting his ministry. I don't know exactly how young. But he admits in the next part that he's young, that he lacks experience, that he lacks age. But God, God says, Jeremiah, you don't lack purpose. And young people have purpose as well. As God calls to Jeremiah to be a man who changed the world, God assures Jeremiah of his purpose in this world by saying four powerful things to Jeremiah. Four powerful, like, purpose-injecting things into this young man. He says, one, you're created with intention. He says, I formed you. He says, two, you're known by God. He says, I knew you, right? You are unique, number three. You're set apart. And number four, you have a critical role. He says, I appointed you. I put you in this role. Those are four things that Jeremiah needed to hear. You know what? Young people need to hear that as well. Young people are hearing a lot of things these days. I think we would all say, we could all agree that young, young people are a little bit distracted these days, right? They have their phone in their hands, they're scrolling and swiping, earbuds in their ears, computers on their laps, game systems attached to their hips. Like, I know, they're distracted. I work with them all the time. I was reading an article recently and this study was conducted in 2018, which I'm sure the numbers have grown since 2018. But it said the majority of age 13 to 7 year olds would confess of 13 to 17 year olds would confess of themselves that they are online with a computer or a cell phone all the time. 45% would say that they are online almost constantly. And 44%, like the other half, would say, well, maybe not constantly, but several times a day. That covers 89% of the 13 to 17-year-olds. They would say, we're online almost all the time. Almost all the time. And this was like pre-pandemic numbers, right? This was before students were at home sitting in front of their uh, computers, learning, doing the on-screen learning. So I'm sure it's exploded by now. I'm sure it's much higher than that. Young people are hearing lots of things from the time that they're sitting in front of that screen. They're, they're hearing it from a lot of sources, but I believe they're not hearing from God enough. Gosh, I wish that stat was that young people uh, were in God's word constantly, but it's not. They're, they're plugged in listening to other sources constantly. You know, if they aren't hearing, hearing from God, they should be hearing from God's people. They should be hearing from godly people around them. And you know, they need to hear exactly what Jeremiah needed to hear. They need to hear, young person, you are created with intention. God formed you with a purpose. They need to hear, young person, you are known by God. God knows you. God knew you when you were knit together in your mother's womb. Young person, you are unique. You're set apart. You're made differently than everyone else. And that's okay. And that's on purpose, right? Young person, you have a critical role. God has appointed you to do something magnificent and something critical in this world. You might say like, okay, uh, Kirby, like that makes sense. But how can I help young people understand that? 
Like, like I just know a couple and they're busy and how could I ever, how could I ever help them understand that? Well, let me tell you, the first thing you can do is you can communicate. You can say those words to them. Say those words to young people, rinse and repeat. Your kids, your grandson, your granddaughter, your nieces, your nephews, that kid next door, tell them. Listen, young person, you're created with intention. God knows you, you're unique, and you have a critical role in this world. Guys, they need to hear that truth. They desperately need to know those four things. Tell them that they are enough. Tell them over and over, and they'll hear you. The next thing that you could do, and this requires a little bit more of you, you could take a step further and you could become a mentor. You can make a commitment to be a constant presence in a young person's life. Show them that they have purpose by saying, I'm going to put my time where my mouth is. I'm going to invest my time in your life because you have purpose. We've been meeting in person with students uh, for a while now, and uh, we are in desperate need all the time of godly people who will say, I would be a mentor. I would be willing to invest my time in a young person. I would be willing to show them that they have purpose with my time. As we start back up in person next week, which I know um, so many of us are going to be here on campuses, um, we're going to have kids ministry here on campuses. And we are going to need people just like you who are willing to invest in little kids, who are willing to hang with little kids, share the love of God, show them that they have purpose on a regular basis. You could be that person for a young person. If you're interested in serving, it's really super easy. All you got to do is go to woodmanvalley.org backslash serve the church, enter your info, and we'll get right back to you. And we'll figure out a good spot for you. You know, the proof is in the pudding. If we really believe young people have purpose, that young people are created with intention, that they're not like some sort of cosmic accident, that young people are known by God, that young people are unique and they have an important role, we can also prove it to them with the opportunities that we trust young people with. And that's really what God does in this next part of Jeremiah. In verse six, here's what he says. At last, sovereign Lord, this is Jeremiah speaking, I do not know how to speak for I am too young. Again, he's a young person. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Jeremiah had two issues with what God was asking him to do. The first one was the liability of like, I don't know how. I lack experience. A lot could go wrong. I don't know how. The second one was this excuse of, I'm too young. I lack confidence. I lack capability. But you know, being young is not an excuse or a liability. And young people need to know that. When I was a a kid, I had like, I had this amazing uncle. He he always bought us the most best and the most dangerous gifts for Christmas snowboards and puppies and sleds and a six foot tall teddy bear and ponies. It it was awesome. Parents, I'm sure your kids have a person like this, right? Who every year they have to get something that makes you a little bit uncomfortable. That was my uncle. Every time he had like a big box for us to open, I would watch my mom squirm a little bit because she was nervous about what was in there. The best gift I think he ever got me and my brothers and sisters was this giant trampoline. It was probably when I was like six and we used it until like my sister was 18 for so for like 20 years, right? And I know lots of kids who have trampolines these days. Um, I know it seems like a lot of kids have them. But whenever I got mine, I was like the first kid I had ever heard of with a giant trampoline. It was like the first one I had ever seen. None of my friends had one and, and it was awesome. 
It was glorious in like its raw, giant, dangerous form. It was awesome. So all the neighborhood kids and friends from school who came to my house, that's, that's what they wanted to do is go jump on the tramp, right? And so the, we, we had a few broken arms. Uh, we had uh, lots of wind getting knocked out, uh, some cold nights trying to sleep out on the trampoline. Uh, we had some incredible times on that trampoline. It was such a good gift for my uncle. This summer, uh, for my daughter's birthday, my mom, I, I think maybe revenge, I don't know if it was revenge, but my mom was like, I, I got her a big trampoline. And I'm like, great, <laughs> you know? And so, of course, the dad always has to assemble, right? And uh, dads, I'm sure many of you have felt the, the, the need to do that over the past few days. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I had to do. So one afternoon in June, in June, my daughter and I, we began to kind of put this huge trampoline together. Remembering my trampoline as a kid, I'm like, there's really nothing to these things. It should be easy. But let me tell you, this was an extensive process. What, what took the longest was all the safety devices, all the warning. I couldn't believe how much different it was than the trampoline that I had when I was a kid. There was one label that said like one person at a time on the trampoline. And I was like, how do you do the crack the egg game if only one person can get on there at a time? right? There was another one that said, don't use when wet. And I was like, we used to like hook up the hose and that was like the best part in the summer when it was hot outside. Then there was all these like spring pads and a net and foam and vinyl covers for everything you could possibly like bonk your head on or get pinched or smack yourself with. Like everything had a nice little cover. And mine that my uncle had got for me when I was a kid, it didn't have any of those things at all. Now, I understand that be, between my trampoline and my daughter's trampoline, someone probably got hurt and sued and an insurance company began to require all this extra stuff. I get it. And this is a generalization, of course. But here's what I think all the equipment, the safety equipment, the warnings that our young people see on a daily basis have really communicated to the current generation of young people. We've shown them that they're a liability that they're not capable of handling important or risky things. By our good intentions of insulating them from danger, we've actually created a generation of young people who are full of excuses, who are ill-equipped and who lack confidence to deal with significant problems and obstacles in life. And I'm, I'm not saying every single young person is like this, but I do see this often. And often when young people have the opportunity to do significant, like, big things, two things. Liability, like we don't give them the opportunity because we're afraid of what might happen and who could get upset and what could go wrong and they don't know what they're doing. Or the excuse, right? Well, they're too young. The young person probably makes excuse for them. I've never done this before. I don't know what I'm doing. Just like Jeremiah. You know, unfortunately, If we have young people who've grown up in a safe world with no risk, they won't experience any reward. They won't experience the sweet taste of taking a risk and succeeding or the lessons learned when you take a risk and you fail and it hurts and it's not pleasant. And and if we tell young people that they can't and they shouldn't, and we fill their lives full of caution labels and warnings of liability and safety devices. We're not helping them. Jeremiah didn't have warning labels or safety devices to encourage the excuses or the fear of liability. But he still had those excuses. He still was worried that he wasn't capable, that he didn't have purpose. He says, God, I'm too young. I don't know how. And God has this incredible remedy It's not more pads, it's not more warnings, it's not more safety devices. To this young person who's full of excuses, God says, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. God comes alongside young Jeremiah, helps him, and gives him a significant role, like kingdom and nations uh, oversight sort of rule, role. Church, you are surrounded by an incredible resource, and it's young people. Do you want to see 2021 turn out differently than 2020? 
Do you want to reach our city? Do you want to see God's kingdom expand in our country and in our world? It's possible. I believe that. How? I think we need to hand over the keys. What do I mean by handing over the keys? I mean, you have important, valuable things in your life that are locked up, that are under lock and key, right? Your car, your house, your boat, your church, your office building, your safe. And for those things, you hold the keys to them because they're valuable and you wouldn't want someone taking liberty or abusing or hurting or wasting any of those things that are under lock and key because you're responsible for them. You make the payment, you pay for the insurance, and you're the one who has to answer when they come up missing or broke and need fixing. I get it. That makes sense. But what if in 2021, we looked at the keys that we have and we select some young people who we would say, I would trust you with these significant things that I am responsible for. I am going to be with you and coach you and help you, but I'm going to trust you with something significant. And we gave young people the keys. Isn't that what God did for Jeremiah? He handed him the keys to nations and kingdoms, even though he was young and inexperienced and didn't know what he was doing. Isn't that what God did for eight-year-old King Josiah, who led a nation? I'm not exactly saying, like, give the keys to your Tesla to a 13-year-old. Not at all. But I am saying, let's, let's evaluate the things that we hold in our lives that are significant and important. And let's Let's figure out how do we trust and empower young people to take responsibility for them. Not making excuses, not worrying about the liability, but saying, young person, you have purpose and you are capable. I'm here with you. I think you can do something significant. Is there a lot of risk with that? Absolutely. Could people get hurt? Yep. Could it be sketchy? Definitely. Could it cost you money and time and some tears? Absolutely. Will you have a young person afterward who's more confident and better equipped to live life and to lead? 100%. Will you have a young person who has tasted the sweet rewards of taking risk and succeeding or learn the good lessons when it comes to taking risk and failing? Definitely. You will have a young person who is more capable, who is more motivated because you've given given them significant opportunity and you've shown them that they're capable. You've shown them that they have purpose by entrusting them with that opportunity. If we would only risk a little and give young people the keys, guys, I think we could see young people rise and lead us. I guarantee you, if you give a young person an opportunity in coaching, you'll get to see what I'm talking about. In my life, in my job, I'm surrounded by young people and I never cease to be amazed at the things that they are capable of. So would you be willing to give young people the keys? I think we would have a generation of way better equipped young people. So three things we covered this morning, church. First, young people. Would you live a life like they are capable Not the church of the future, but capable of leading and doing significant things currently. Would you show young people they have purpose by saying, hey, young person, you were created with intention. God knows you. You're unique and you have a critical role in this world. Would you be willing to show them that they have purpose by investing some time in them? Again, you can go to woodmanvalley.org backslash serve the church. Jump in on an opportunity right there. Would you demonstrate to young people that being young is not an excuse, it's not a liability, by giving them keys to significant opportunities? Let me pray. Father, as we embark on this new year, God, I am excited for the possibilities. God, I am excited as I just think about the young people that you've entrusted uh, to Woodman. God, the young people who... Uh, call this place home. God, I, I know that there's tremendous potential to reach our city that rests within these young people. Father, I pray, God, that you will help us as adults to see the capability, to see the purpose in young people, and God, to be willing to hand over the keys to big, significant things, God, so that we can see them thrive. And Lord, that's, that's really what we desire. 
We desire that the next generation would thrive. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You unravel me with a melody You surround me with a song Of deliverance from my enemies Until all my fears are gone oh, I'm no longer child of God oh, I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God oh. And from my mother's womb you have chosen me, love has called my name, and I've been born again into your family, your blood flows through my veins, come on we sing it, oh, I'm no longer
I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. As we reflect on 2020, as it comes to a close, I wanted to thank God, number one, for his faithfulness to us as we have been provided opportunities to serve those in our community and around the world. I also want to thank many of you who have stepped up and served in different ways and unique ways and have been able to serve those in our community and also to provide out of your abundance to those with need. And as we look forward to the year 2021, I'm grateful for the opportunities that God will place before us. Number one is we have an opportunity with two new facilities coming. Uh, one is the addition of Woodman Heights will open during 2021, and we also have started construction with our Monument Campus. These places will provide additional opportunities for more people to hear God's Word. And as Pastor Kirby challenged us this morning, these places will also give space to our youth to find the hope of Christ. And next week, we will start our in-person services for some. And for others, we will continue with our online, in our huddles, or in our homes. And we're grateful for these opportunities. I want to thank Pastor Josh, the staff, and my fellow elders as we have spent numerous hours this year in prayer and thoughtful discussion about God's guidance uh, for us. I also want to Thank many of you who have spent time in prayer for us and have encouraged us and sent us words of encouragement. I've been blessed by those. Now let me pray for us. Father, I am grateful to you for the many things that you have provided this past year. 2020 has been a difficult year and a year of challenges for us as individuals and for us as a church. But God, you've been faithful to provide. And we thank you for that faithfulness. And Father, I am so thankful that you have raised up the people of Woodman to care about our community and to step up and serve and provide. Father, we look in anticipation for 2021 and what you have in store for us. Father, we know that you once again will be faithful. Father, I pray that you will find us faithful as well. Father, that we will serve those that you bring before us, that we will share Christ with them, and many will come to know you as Savior. Father, we pray uh, for your guidance this year. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. And now go with this benediction. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.